Well, good morning. We're glad that you're here, glad that you've joined us this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. If you're new to the Bible, that's in the New Testament. Uh, you can uh, go there, find John chapter 4. If you find regular names like Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, you're close. If you've got some weird names like Malachi, Zechariah, uh, Habakkuk, uh, which is multiple K's in it, you've got to keep going towards the end. Uh, it's uh, in the New Testament there, and we are uh, in a series called I Am. Last week, uh, well, I guess two weeks ago, really, uh, we started with kind of a history lesson. We were in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we looked at the story of Moses, and uh, we saw that God gave Moses his name, uh, and he said, tell them, I am has sent you. Uh, and while this story took place in the 13th century B.C., right, 13th century B.C., it still has relevance for you and for me today. Uh, you say, Frank, why does it have relevance to you and to me today? Why does Moses' story have relevance today? Because when God gave him his name, I am, uh, it means Yahweh, uh, the, uh, Y-A-H-W-E-H. More specifically, uh, I am that I am. And it really means I am what I am, I am what I was, and I am what I forever will be. So it's all of that encompassed because God is an eternal God, forever created, and he is speaking to us and he's giving us his name as we kind of fast forward from Exodus through Malachi to Malachi chapter three, verse six, you'll see on the screen that it says this, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. We see that the Lord doesn't change, that he is what he was, he is what he is, and he is what he forever will be. And Jesus takes that kind of to the next level. Uh, and Paul, or, or the writer of Hebrews actually, uh, says in Hebrews 13, 8, he says, listen about Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As he begins to uh, give us his name, as God gives us his name in 13th century BC, I, I looked it up and I started to begin to think about some of the things that are happening. I don't know what the Shang dynasty is, but in the 13th century BC in China, the Shang dynasty was there. The, the pyramids that you see uh, that Ramses built uh, there and uh, uh, all the cities that you can kind of know about in Egypt, that's the same time frame. Uh, our daughter's in college. She's down at Mississippi College. She's in the New Testament class, she said, Dad, did you know, uh, did you know that like uh, Socrates and Aristotle are before Jesus Christ? And I said, yes, I did. She said, Dad, I never knew that. And I said, I said, there's a lot of history that sinks in together and how it works. And so as we begin to uh, last two weeks, got this history lesson, you may say, Frank, thanks for the history lesson. Thanks for all of that. What does it even mean to us? And what we've said and the reason we're in this series is because Jesus came. He lived. He died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And he said, I am. Uh, today, we'll see that he says, I am the Messiah to the Samaritan woman. But over the next few weeks, we'll see eight times that Jesus reveals himself as the I am. I am the bread. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And we'll see how he begins to move and speak to us. And he is in those words, in those moments, as he is speaking, he is revealing himself as God. He is revealing himself as the one that has been and forever will be. He is saying, I have been a part of this story that God has been writing from the beginning. And we are part of the story that God has been writing. And we will continue to write until Jesus' return. We gather in moments like these. We celebrate in worship. We come together to, to, to give praise, to sing, to pray, to worship. And a lot of times, can we just be honest? When we gather, it's really about us. We walk in and we think, what can I get? What can I hear? God, what do I need to do? How do I need to be molded and shaped into your image? And those aren't bad thoughts. But this thing that we're doing as, as simple church, as we're walking through, it's bigger than us. It's bigger than a church. It's bigger than the kingdom. It, I mean, it's bigger than the area of life. It is a kingdom thing. What we realize is, is that as we are focusing on ourselves and our lives, this gathering today is bigger. It's bigger than a church. It's bigger than the Bible Belt Christianity. It's bigger than American religion. Following Jesus is not a Bible Belt thing. It's not a Mid-South thing. It's not a Southern thing. It is a whole world thing today, right now, 
all across the world, Christians are gathering together to worship and celebrate. Some in rooms that are public and that are, uh, that are, that are smaller or larger than this space. And then some that are private because they cannot gather together legally in their countries. And what we realize is, as we begin to look at God's word, that this thing is bigger than us. And Jesus is calling for us to expand the gospel, to continue to share his name with the whole world. This is an all nations thing. And at Simple Church, we, we've said that we're big believers in reading the Bible. We're big believers in reading the Bible. I'm hoping and praying that you have a plan, that you are walking out this year, that you are accomplishing reading the Bible. But we're not just into reading the Bible for knowledge's sake. We're reading into reading the Bible for believing what it says. And not only believing what it says, then allowing what it says to mold and shape our hearts and lives. So whether you're a high school student or you're a kid that went next door or you're a senior adult or you're a median adult, you put yourself in whatever category you find yourself uh, or you're a young adult or you find you don't know where you are fit in that. Listen, it's called to mold and shape our lives and we want to read God's word, be changed by it and allow it to move us and mold us and to shape us into his image. So as we jump in today to this series, uh, we'll be in the gospel of John chapter four, looking at a story called the woman uh, at the well or Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And we'll see three conversations. If you'll hold with me, I wanna read a lot of the scripture because the story speaks so clearly to us. It says this, Uh, In uh, chapter four, verse one, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Verse four, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied to her, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Verse 15, he says, she says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Verse 16, crazy moment in the life and speakings of Jesus. Jesus says to her, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. And in verse 17, she replied, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. The woman in verse 19 says, Sir, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, 
This is the key phrase. I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back, shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have the kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then he explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are ripe for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest. Where did you plant? Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you have told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. What a great story. There is so much in that story jam-packed into the uh, 40-something verses that we read. As we read this story, we need to realize that this story is early in the ministry of Jesus. He was preaching, he was teaching, he was healing, and along with leading his disciples, he was kind of gathering a crowd. This crowd began to gather, they began to teach, he began to uh, explain things, and they began to listen to him because he was teaching as one who had authority. But I just want to be honest with you, in this moment in John chapter 4, both the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders, and Jesus' disciples are still not sure who he truly is. They're not sure, is he the Messiah? Uh, Is he a prophet? Is he someone who is to come? Who is he? And they're hoping he's the Messiah, but they are sure that he for sure is a teacher that has authority, that he has come and he has authority to, to teach and preach the gospel. And so in this moment, we see three conversations. Let's start with the last one first, uh, and then we'll go to the first two, right? Hey, I know the screens aren't working. Do you want me to fix them right now so that you can have them? We don't have to fake it, right? Uh, So do you want me to fix them right now so you have the words on there? Uh, Or do you want me to just keep going? I'll just keep going. Here we go. So there are three conversations. Let's start with the last one first. You can write this down, Jesus and the Samaritans. Jesus and the Samaritans. At the end of the chapter, we see that many Samaritans from the village believed. So there's this moment of Jesus with the woman at the well. He is entering into Samaria. As we begin to read this scripture, there are things that that we, it would be like uh, saying to us, he he went through uh, this village or that village. Um, in, In different places where we have lived, there have been places where people are like, oh man, you don't want to go there, right? Uh, and when we lived in South Louisiana, there was a place called Coyell, uh, C-O-L-Y-E-L, uh, Coyell. And they would say, oh, if you're from Coyell, you don't even have shoes, right? Uh, you got webs between your toes. That's what they would say. I mean, there's places like that everywhere. I'm not exactly sure, and I won't name a place here locally uh, where, where people would be like, oh, you don't want to go to there, right? Drive around there. Probably it's Memphis, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, but what we realize is, is there's that place everywhere. As we're reading this scripture and we see the word Samaria, as we see the word Samaritans, we realize there is a rift. We read it. Uh, The woman says, why would you speak to me, a woman, a Samaritan woman? And it says that the Jews and the Samaritans had a divide one with another. The Samaritans would say, hey, we're, we're relatives of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons. That's what they would say. They say, we're true Israelites. We're true Jewish people. But biblical history says that they were people who were placed in Israel during the exile by the Assyrians and that they were kind of placed while everybody else was exiled to kind of take the place and kind of learn some of 
the traditions to then be intermarried with those Israelites that would come back. So Jesus, it says in the scripture, had to travel through Samaria. Now we could all conjecture here this morning. We could kind of give our thoughts of why Jesus had to go. I'm just telling you, there is kind of a driving force in him because he wants to share who he is with this Samaritan woman. He also knows that some Samaritans will come to faith in Jesus Christ, that they will believe in him because of his message and his words. We, we don't know why he had to go, but we realize that he chose to go Samaria. He could have gone around, right? He could have taken the loop. He could have gone 269 around uh, up to Millington, right? He could have done that, but he didn't. He went straight through into Memphis. And we realized that he had a desire and a passion for this Samaritan woman to speak to her. Why? Because he does it. What we realize is, is that because he speaks to her, she leaves him, tells what he said and says, this prophet has told me everything about my life. And so at the end of the third conversation, we see that many Samaritans from the village came and they're like, hey, we want you to stay. We want to hear your message. We want to trust you and we want to believe in you. Jesus is reaching the nations. These villagers, these Samaritan villagers respond to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the testimony of the Samaritan woman. They heard the message and they believed. They heard the message and believed. So it leads us to the second conversation. Go back to the front end of the passage that we read today. John chapter 4 verses 1 through 26. It's this moment of Jesus speaking with the woman. We see two things as he is speaking to the Samaritan woman. We see Jesus as fully man. We see Jesus as fully man. He is walking. Uh, I don't know how many of you love to walk, like uh, you would choose to walk everywhere if you didn't have to have a car. Uh, probably not very many of us, but, uh, but uh, he was walking everywhere. There were no cars. It was the way of travel. And we see Jesus as fully man. In verse five, we see where it says, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. We see Jesus as fully man. He was tired. He'd walked a long time and he just wanted to get off his feet he wanted to get some water and he wanted to sit there. And then the disciples, I guess they had this plan. The disciples are going to go get food, bring it back, and they're going to have their water and they're going to have their food. We see Jesus as fully man, but we also see Jesus in this moment as fully God because he reaches out. He reaches out across uh, uh, relational uh, boundaries, right? He reaches across, uh, across uh, boundaries that, that, that typically were not crossed. A Jewish man reached out to a Samaritan. Now, let's just be honest. It also uh, is, is a huge deal that she was a woman. It just, it, uh, ladies in the room, uh, we love you. Men in this room, we love our ladies. Amen? Yeah, right. Uh, we're super thankful. We're thankful that our world is changing, uh, uh, that it has changed uh, and we want it to continue to change. Uh, we uh, we listen, I couldn't do what I've done over the last 23 years of ministry without Ann Valenzano. Right. Uh, she's not a two step behind me lady. She's a lock arm with me. We're walking this thing together. That's how we uh, do our marriage. Now, she believes that I'm uh, the authority in our household, that I'm the head of who God has given to me, but we're partners in ministry. She is, uh, as scripture would say, our help, my helpmate, right? We're walking together in this. Uh, but also at the same time, she realizes that God has placed a burden on men's life. Men in this room, you have a burden if you're married to be the leader of your household, right? To drive and walk and do. Young men, you will in some day in the future be leading your household. And what we realize is, is in this moment, uh, Jesus steps out not only to the Samaritan, but to the woman. Because in that day and age, they didn't. Thankfully, ladies, we're glad that you, uh, we can have conversation with you and we can talk with you and we can be encouraged by you and you can challenge us in, to live and be better men and to be all that God has created us to be and we can walk this thing together. But we see in this moment that he's fully God as he reaches across and he says, would you give me a drink? It's 
amazing weaving of conversation begins to happen. It says in verse nine, the woman was surprised for Jews to refuse, have anything to do with Samaritan. And then uh, she's like, why would you talk to me? I'm a woman. And Jesus replied in this kind of random way, if you knew who was sitting here, basically is what he says. If you knew the gift of God that he has for you in this moment and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you water. And as, I mean, like as you and I probably would in that moment, she goes, hey, you don't have a bucket. You don't have a rope. You don't have anything to get uh, the water from this well. She's thinking very physical in nature. And she responds, he responds and saying, anyone who drinks the water that I have uh, will never thirst again. But if you drink the water out of this well, you will, will thirst again. And in this moment, we see that Jesus is fully God in verse 15, as he says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water that I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. And Jesus, in his fully God moment, says these words, go get your husband. What? You can imagine the shock in her mind when she thinks, what is this guy, what is this guy saying? Like, I don't have a husband. He says, go get your husband. Here's what I know about Jesus. He's a perfect gentleman. He will be patiently waiting on us to respond. And in that moment, he was not being harsh. He was not being rude. He was not being uh, distracting or, 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 or judgmental in that moment. But he was, he was speaking the truth to this woman in love. And she responds, I don't have a husband. And Jesus in his fully God moment, because he knows all things, he says, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the one you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And from verse 18 to verse 19, we see this random shift of the woman and she begins to talk about religion. She begins to talk about where to worship and where to be and all these things. But I wanna tell you in this moment, in this fully man moment where, where Jesus is needing a drink and the fully God moment where he knows exactly who this woman is, where she's been and where she will go, Jesus in this moment is both grace and truth. John 1, 17 says, Moses came with the law, but Jesus came with both grace and truth. Jesus, he could have brought the hammer down on her, right? He could have brought judgment on her, but he chose salvation, not condemnation. A lot of us know John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, right? But verse uh, uh, 17 uh, is, is even as important. <clears throat> says this, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through them. Jesus could have brought judgment, but he chose to bring salvation to this lady. And she begins to respond by asking religious questions. Now, many believe that she was trying to deflect, right? Uh, uh, but I want to tell you, I think her response looks more like intrigue to a man who may know all the answers to everything that has ever been happening in this world. She knows that he's at least a prophet. But I think that she's not deflecting into just religion, into, into where to worship or this, but I think it's got her heartstrings. I think in that moment she's thinking, I, I, I've been so away and so distracted and so pulled away from regular life that if I will believe what this man has to offer, then maybe I could enter back into society. We, we didn't even talk about that the woman was coming to the well at noontime. Uh, I'm just being honest. Uh, I'm, I've never had to go get water from a well, right? Never had to do it. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it, I've been in both Nicaragua and Zambia, and I've seen uh, uh, ladies and children going to uh, get water at the well. They typically do not do that at new time in the noontime sun. They do that in the morning or late in the evening so that they're not walking right in the middle of the day. And she's only there by herself. And what we realize is, is Jesus is speaking. I don't think she's trying to deflect into a religious uh, uh, situation. I think she really wants to know how can she enter back into society? How can she jump wholeheartedly in? And how can Jesus have the answer? And in John chapter 4, 25 and 26, the woman begins to speak. She begins to speak about where to worship, Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. She begins to talk about, uh, you know, what must we do? And Jesus begins talking about worshiping in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. 
the one who's called the Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus looks at this lady, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, and he, has, he says something that he has not said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious elites of the day, and he says something that he's not even said to his very own disciples. I am the Messiah. Frank, why does he pick this lady of all people? I don't know. We don't even know her name. We just know she's the woman, the woman at the well. Can I, can I tell you, now we live in a day and age where um, what Jesus says and, um, and the things that he's done uh, kind of stand in the opposite of um, a lot of people who would say, you know what, Jesus didn't care about women. And I want to tell you, if there is someone that cared about women, Jesus is him. Uh, there are moments in scripture where it's unreal. Uh, this moment is one of them. The moment in which Jesus uh, forgives the sin of the adulterous woman is another moment. Another moment is, is when a woman comes and begins to wash his feet. Jesus raises women up to a level unlike any other prophet or uh, the person uh, that has brought uh, a message to us. And he says, listen, I am the Messiah. I'm the rescuer, I'm the redeemer, I'm the savior. And in this conversation, she believes, she responds, and she leaves. And she goes, and she begins to tell the villagers what Jesus had said to her. Now listen, what we don't have is the follow-up, right? <laughs> We don't know what Jesus said to her, like, right? We don't know, like, does she go and get married to the man she's living with? Does she kick him out? What, what happens in that situation? And I just want to tell you, in, when I read this scripture, the big thing is, is that she believes. And here's the thing, God handles the rest of that. And here's our problem sometimes. Can I just, can I not say our problem? Can I say, here's my problem sometimes. Sometimes I want to fix all the back end stuff for people or for myself instead of letting Jesus handle all that. And so a lot of times we're pointing the finger at other people. My pastor in Walker, Louisiana, I told uh, Deacon this morning, he was the king of one-liners. Uh, if, uh, I told Deacon this one, he used to say, he used to say this one, if something looked like it couldn't happen, he's like, man, uh, that, uh, oh, Deacon, what'd I say? Oh, man, that'll go over like a pregnant woman pole vaulting. That's what, that was my favorite one of it. He's like, if something wasn't, if something wasn't gonna happen, he's like, oh man, that's not gonna go over. That, that won't go over like a pregnant woman pole vaulting. For those of you who are like thinking, what does that mean? Uh, it'd be very hard for a pregnant woman, I think, to pole vault. Not that it couldn't happen, but I think it'd be very hard. <laughs> I say all that to say uh, because, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, I didn't think that was coming out today. Uh, uh, it's got me so thrown off, I can't even think what I was saying. Uh, man. Uh, 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 Where did you come from? <laughs> Where did you come from? Uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Judgment. He used to say this. When we're judging, he said, listen, you can point one finger at other people, but you better realize you got three fingers pointing back at you. And I want to tell you, if Jesus, one day he will judge us for our good deeds and our bad. But if right now he's coming not to judge, but to bring salvation, you know what we need to be doing? Not judging and coming to bring salvation to people. And so listen, I'm so glad as a messed up freshman in college, Jesus called me to himself. Now, listen, I don't have a crazy wild testimony. I was so scared of Georgiana Valenzano. That's my mom. Uh, she's five foot nine, uh, a solid woman who would take me out. She used to look at me and she said, if I brought you in, I can take you out of this world. And I'll just be honest with you. I didn't do crazy wild things. But the truth of the matter is, as a freshman in college, I was running doing my own thing and Jesus brought me to himself. He didn't say, Frank, you got to fix all this stuff first, Right? You don't have to fix all this and then come, but he said, come and I'll handle all the rest. And what he's calling us in our conversations is to be both grace and truth and to be mindful of what we're calling people to. That we don't have to call people to fix everything on the front end before they come to Jesus so that they can live then a perfect life. 
Because the reality is, is you and I don't live a perfect life. But we're called to call people to Christ, to lead them to Jesus so that we can make sure that they know who he is and then let Jesus and his Holy Spirit, who's much better fixer than we are, right? Begin to mold and shape them into their image. And now, that doesn't mean we don't walk alongside people and encourage people and help, help see, let people see the truth of what God's word says. I don't think Jesus was like, oh, just keep, just keep hanging out with this guy. That's good. No, he, 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 he wanted her to be more. Why? Because he desired better for her. He desires better for you and for me. And in the moment, she believes, she responds, and she leaves. And then we see the third conversation, Jesus and his disciples. Now, can we just be honest? This is a conversation is one of confusion. The disciples come back. They're like, why is he talking to this woman? What's going on here? Uh, she leaves out because she's received the good news and believed it, that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the Messiah. And Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms and the disciples are thinking uh, physical, right? They're like, He's like, he's like, Jesus, we got the food. And he's like, I've got food you couldn't even imagine. And they're like, somebody brought Jesus Subway? What? Do they, they door dashed him here? Out here in Sychar, they got door dashed? They, they brought that to him? They, they can't even understand. Listen, Jesus is speaking in the spiritual realm and the disciples are thinking physical. And we need to have and keep our spiritual eyes open open, you and me. We need to always need to be thinking of the physical things that God is doing for us or that he's doing in our world, but we need to look to the spiritual things because the fields are ripe to the harvest. They begin to speak. Jesus kind of turns as the, he, they turn from food and he begins to talk about the harvest and he begins to talk about uh, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around because the fields are ripe to the harvest. You can imagine they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? I'm not, I'm not seeing it. And then all of a sudden, these people from Samaria begin to walk and they begin to listen to Jesus and they invite them to stay. All the while, the disciples have no clue. He has not let them in on the secret that he is the Messiah. We see these three very, very, very different conversations. So you say, Frank, what does that have to do with me? I would just ask, what do your conversations with Jesus sound like? What do your conversations with Jesus sound like? Are you always thinking about the physical? Are you like the disciples? You're thinking about the physical needs of your life and he's trying to open your eyes to the spiritual things that he's trying to do behind the scenes that we have no clue about. Are you uh, speaking uh, to Jesus and you're deflecting off of things? You're like, no, Jesus, I don't want to talk about what's happening in my real life. I want to talk about these things over here. I want to talk about, about uh, food and water and drink. What do your conversations with Jesus sound like? Um, I hope uh, as I stand here and I sit there and I see you uh, all across our county or you come to my house and we hang out and drink coffee or I, I, I spend time with you, I hope you think and I hope you will continue to think Frank is who Frank is. It's all I can be. Uh, Rebecca, I'm looking at you nodding your head. And Rebecca says, uh, Frank in the wild. Uh, Frank in the wild. When Frank is in the wild, right? Because, I, I mean, some people don't know pastors. They don't know their pastor. They don't know or have a relationship with them. But when Frank is in the wild, Frank wants to be just who he is. I want to tell you, uh, Frank is a mess, right? Like, I don't have everything together. You say, well, Frank, do I want to follow it? Do I want to follow you? What? It's, it's you following, uh, you're going to follow you? I mean, we're, we're, we're all a mess. We're all sinners, saved by God's grace. But, I mean, and you, you could ask Deacon. You could ask Ethan. Sometimes I don't respond Christ-like. Somebody asked me one time, do you always, are, have this, I don't really know I have this calm voice. It's just the voice that God gave me. People are like, do you always respond to your kids like that? Like, hey, Deacon, stop that. No, no. <laughs> Ethan, Ethan, stop that now, son. We don't want to, no. Like, I hope you realize that and recognize that. But are our conversations with Jesus real and raw and authentic? Because I, I know pastors who, I'm like, I look at Leah and I'm like, 
I listen to them and I'm like, do you speak to your wife with that voice? When, you know, when, when God is like four syllables, God said, and yet if, if you, right? I mean, you know those guys, you've heard them before on TV. Uh, I'm like, do you talk to your wife with that voice? No, you don't. No, you don't. We're called to be real and raw and authentic. And what are our conversations with Jesus sound like? Can I just be honest with you? Um, I told Amanda right before we walked in here, um, there's a weight that's on my shoulders because uh, I know that I've got this week and next week and then on the 11th and the 18th, my father-in-law, he's going to preach for us those uh, two, uh, two Sundays. He's going to be hanging out with Deacon Nathan. We're headed to Cleveland, Ohio for Ann to have an open heart surgery. Like there is this weight, two weights, right? The weight of the open heart surgery is first. And then the weight of like, man, I want to make sure that I've gotten everything to everybody so that everything happens and we know. So like, I'm like, Randall, would you take pictures so that we can know, so I can draw up a diagram? Hey, Amanda, I know you got things covered, but I want to be able to hand everything off. Like there's just, there's a weight there, right? That's secondary weight to the weight of the open heart surgery uh, that Anne is going to be having. But the reality is over the last couple of weeks, my conversations with Jesus have been very raw and very honest and very real. They don't have platitudes. It's like, oh, Lord, you know how I know. Like, God, I, I'm at the, I'm at, I'm, I have no control. I, I mean, I told uh, Hannah, I couldn't do the surgery. I couldn't even see the surgery. I don't want to see a video about the surgery or else I'll throw up on this floor right here. <laughs> right? Don't talk to me about it. Like, I don't want to know. Like, because I can't control that. And I'm just going to tell you, God wants to hear the authenticity and realness in our conversations to him. What do your conversations with Jesus sound like? God, this is beyond me. This is beyond what I can accomplish and do. God, I'm a mess. I need you to help me here, here, and here. How do you respond in those conversations when you speak with Jesus? But secondly, what do your conversations with those in your world look like? What do your conversations with those in your world look like? For you and for me, we should have, we should have a moment where we are speaking the truth of the gospel. It's a spoken thing, right? Jesus couldn't just assume by saying, hey, I've got water that you could never, uh, that you'll, you'll drink and you will never thirst again. Uh, you, and just kind of speak in code to this lady. Uh, he, he, he could have done that, but that's not what he did. He said, listen, I am the Messiah. It takes us speaking with our real words that we say we are Christ followers and we want to invite you to Jesus Christ too with our friends, with our coworkers, with our family members, with those that we love and care for. What are your conversations with those in your world look like? Are, would they even know? Would they be like, Frank loves football. Frank loves this. Frank loves that. But they're like, man, Frank, we don't even know about this part of his life. Would they be like that for you? Or is it real and raw and honest? Now listen, I love, I love that Jesus in his conversation did not condemn her, but was very straightforward with grace and truth. Some of you, you're grace people. You got grace down, but you need truth in your life. So you need to sometimes look at people and have more truth in your conversations. You need to say, hey, this is what uh, grace is, but this is what God's word says, right? Some of you, you're truth people, and you're like black and white. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, nail it. And you need more grace in your life. Uh, those of you who are, uh, are, are that way, your spouse is smiling right now, right? I mean, you're, if you're a truth person, uh, they know. They know, hey, you just need to be gracious about that. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, if you balance grace and truth, it's called walking by the Holy Spirit of God. And we, we can do that. You and I can do that. What do your conversations with Jesus sound like? What do your conversations with those in your world sound like? I want to tell you, the coolest thing about this is, is that this message has application for us today because Jesus says, I am the Messiah, the rescuer, the redeemer, the Lord, the Savior. And here's what I want to tell you. That today, if you have not believed in Jesus, that same Jesus, he was the same yesterday, he is the same today, and he's the same forever. And that invitation for you to believe and for him to speak truth to you, to, uh, to give you truth, both in grace and truth, will come. 
and he's wanting you to believe in him. And I want to tell you this morning, it's as simple uh, as uh, ABC to be forgiven and to be redeemed. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the Messiah, he is the Lord, he is the Savior. And then C, confess and commit to him. And not only is this the way you believe in him for the first time, but it, for a lot of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, it's how you say, stay intimately connected with Jesus. You admit that you're still a sinner. Yeah, you may be saved. God may have given you new life, but you are still a sinner and you are a saved sinner. But we admit when we're wrong. We admit when we're walking in sin and when we need to be forgiven. But then you need to be believe. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is that he is still our savior, that he is still holding on to us, that none of us can get out of his grasp, that we can stay connected to him. And then we need to confess our sin and commit our lives to him. Would you this week commit your conversations to the Lord? Would you ask him to be the Lord of your conversations, not only with him, but with others in your community and that we would be found faithful to have the words of Jesus on our lips. You say, Frank, how, how do I do this? How, how, how do I practically do this? It's hard. I am in, I, while I can do this all day long, I'm an introvert by nature. You say, Frank, you're not an introvert. Uh, I'm an introvert by nature. This morning, uh, when I got up at 6.10, I, 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 this is the way I feel like I, 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 I kind of get to the old car with the cranks. You remember those? None of y'all remember those. Uh, but you kind of got to get to the, get, get, kind of crank it up. I got to crank it up to be able to say, Hey, it's so nice to meet you. How's it going today? Chris, Lee, so good to meet you. This and this and that, right? Like to meet new people and to be out and to, 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 to do that, I've gotta, that's what I've got to do in my life. And what I, what I want you to know is, is that we need to crank our lives up and be yielded to the Holy Spirit so that we would talk about Jesus in our conversations. Not just about church, although that's a good thing, but about Jesus. This is what he's doing. If you're reading his word every day, you got something to say, right? Hey, Jesus said this in his word today. Man, super thankful for Job. Uh, um, that's where I'm at in my, one of my Bible readings. I'm thankful that God is faithful and that when I don't think he's faithful, he's still faithful, right? And I can say hard things to God and he can hear them and he's going to respond to me in grace and truth. Today, we have an opportunity. This week, we have an opportunity in our conversations to be fully abandoned. What a great song, man. Thanks for leading this morning. And in our victories, sometimes we need to shut our mouths and not have the conversations of, look at what I did. We just keep it to ourselves. And in our failures, sometimes we need to walk along with people and say, hey, look at where I failed. And I, I, Jesus is still the same. He loves me. He cares for me. We need to be wholly abandoned and surrendered to him and to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's my prayer, is that we would listen to him and we would respond to him today as he sees fit. Would you join me as we pray? Father, today, we're thankful. We're thankful for you, for how much you love us, for the great grace and mercy that you have for us. God, I'm thankful that you chose to walk through Samaria to sit down at a well at Syker and to have a conversation with a woman, a woman who was not maybe in our lives worthy. But Lord, in your eyes, she was more than worthy. And Father, I'm thankful that you see us in that same way. God, that you've reached down out of heaven to grab our lives. Father, I pray that today, if there's someone here who needs to believe and trust in you, that Lord, you would do in and through them amazing things. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to lead, guide, and direct us. And Father, we're thankful that you are the Messiah and that, Lord, you have come and stepped out of heaven to give us new life. Lord, today I pray that your word would mold and shape us. Father, if we're not reading, that, Lord, we would be faithful to read. And we would not only read, but we would believe and we would allow you to mold and shape us into your image. And that, Father, our conversations this week would be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.